Today's speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Edwards. Dr. Edwards has over a decade of industrial experience in preclinical and clinical pharmacokinetics and pharmacology. He received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from James Madison University and then earned his doctorate in toxicology from the University of Kentucky. He then went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at the North Carolina State University. Dr. Edwards is currently serving as the Senior Director of Clinical and Preclinical Pharmacology and DMPK at Intercept Pharmaceuticals. Jeffrey, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. Thank you, Suzanne. It's my pleasure today to present to you the pharmacokinetics and to a certain extent the pharmacodynamics of a beta cholic acid which is currently approved for the treatment of primary biliary cholangitis, which is approved in the U.S. and by the EMA. During the development program of abeticolic acid, numerous in vitro and clinical studies were conducted to characterize the clinical pharmacology of the drug. What is unique about this program is that we leverage the extensive knowledge on the kinetics and especially the hepatobiliary disposition of endogenous bile acids to explain the pharmacokinetics of the drug. You will see in my talk that I will give an extensive overview of the physiology of bile acids because this will actually lead to the framework for the development of a physiologic pharmacokinetic model that is used to inform the dosing recommendation in subjects with moderate and severe hepatic impairment. My talk is broken up into three parts. The first part will be a review of the bile acid physiology. Next, I will go over the clinical pharmacokinetics of abeticolic acid in healthy subjects, and then use it as a comparison to the pharmacokinetics in patients with hepatic impairment where we see alterations in the systemic exposure. Finally, I will go over the development of a physiologic PK model of OCA that was used to inform the dosing recommendation with hepatic impairment. Now, prior to going into details regarding the physiology of bile acids, I would like to give you a high-level perspective of the significance of hepatobiliary disposition of bile acids with hepatic impairment, as this will relate directly to the PK of OCA. Bile acids primarily reside within the liver-gut axis with minimal systemic distribution. Abeticolic acid appears to have these same characteristics where the drug primarily resides in the liver and the intestine, which is also the primary site of action for the pharmacology of the drug. The issue is that under pathophysiologic conditions, specifically liver cirrhosis, the systemic exposure of bile acids is increased significantly. However, the liver and intestinal exposure only increases modestly. The significance of this for OCA is plasma concentrations can only be used as a surrogate for the liver and the intestine if you understand the relationships between the pathophysiologic changes that occur with cirrhosis that explain the disproportionate increase in the systemic exposure relative to the hepatic and intestinal exposure. So I do understand that I gave you a lot of information there. The following set of slides are going to build up to the final conclusion, which is the recommended dosing of abeticolic acid in patients with moderate and severe hepatic impairment. Bile acids are synthesized in the liver via conversion of cholesterol that is limited and regulated by cytochrome P457A1. There are two primary bile acids in humans, cholic acid, which is shown on the right-hand side, and kinodeoxycholic acid, which is shown on the bottom right-hand side. Bile acids are extensively conjugated to the amino acids glycine and taurine in the liver. In this particular case, I'm showing kinodeoxycholic acid, which is conjugated in the 24 position to glycine to form glyco-CDCA or to taurine to form taro-CDCA. The importance of conjugation is it limits the distribution of bile acids into tissues that express specific transporters involved in the uptake and excretion of bile acids. The primary organs that express these transporters are the liver, the intestine, and to a certain extent, 
the kidney. Bile acids are essential for life as they aid in the absorption of lipids and fat-soluble vitamins. After a meal, bile acids are secreted from the gallbladder into the intestine and form micelles, which aid in the absorption of the lipids and fat-soluble vitamins. Bile acids are extensively taken up in the terminal ileum and are conserved during this entire enterohepatic recirculation process. Bile acids undergo extensive enterohepatic recirculation, which I will show in the following schematics. Conjugated bile acids are excreted from the liver into the bile duct. They are primarily sequestered in the gallbladder and after a meal are excreted into the intestine and aid in the absorption of food. Bile acids are efficiently taken up in the terminal ileum with less than 5% of bile acids being excreted into the colon. Bile acids are then taken up into the liver, completing the cycle. The significance of this is that bile acids primarily reside within the liver gut axis. The bar graph below here shown is from a paper from Fisher et al. who measured the endogenous bile acid level in controlled subjects in the liver and in the serum. And as you can see here, that bile acid levels are much higher in the liver, approximately 20-fold, relative to the serum. Now, although bile acids are essential for life and proper nutritional take-up, bile acid levels that are too high end up being cytotoxic, and therefore bile acids are highly regulated. And the master regulator is the Farnesoid X receptor. The Farnesoid X receptor binds to bile acids and forms a heterodimer with a retinoid X receptor that regulates the transcription of genes involved with bile acid homeostasis. These include genes associated with bile acid transport, which I will talk in subsequent slides, as well as those for binding proteins, as well as two proteins, the small heterodimer partner and FGF19, which are involved in the suppression of bile acid synthesis by regulating CYP7A1. In this diagram here, I'm showing you the liver and the intestine with the transporters that are associated with the uptake and the excretion from the organ. Conjugated bile acids are excreted from the liver into the bile via the bile salt escort pump where they are sequestered in the gallbladder. They are secreted into the ileum after a meal and taken up by the enterocytes in the terminal ileum by the apical sodium-dependent bile acid transporter. Bile acids activate FXR in the enterocyte, leading to a cascade of events. First, there is an induction of the enterocrine fibroblast growth factor 19, or FGF19. FGF19 is released from the enterocyte into the portal blood and activates the FGFR4 receptor on the liver. This, in turn, increases the levels of the small heterodimer protein which then suppresses the levels of CYP7A1 and thus bile acid synthesis. In addition, FXR activation in the enterocyte leads to an induction of the heterodimer transporter organic solute transporter alpha-beta, which is responsible for the excretion of bile acids from the enterocyte into the portal blood. And finally, it causes the induction of the ileobilate acid binding protein and the small heterodimer protein which is thought to be cytoprotectives in the inner site. Bile acids are excreted out of the OST, out of the inner site via the OST heterodimer and taken up by the liver via the sodium taurocholate transporter and the ATP family. Once in the liver, the bile acids can again activate FXR and via regulation on a transcriptional level, they increase the levels of this small heterodimer partner causing suppression of CYP7A1. And here you can actually see a redundancy of system that is occurring between activation of FGFR4 via FGF19, as well as direct activation in the liver itself, signifying the importance of regulating bile acids, especially in the liver. In addition to controlling bile acid synthesis, FXR activation causes an increase in transporters, 
specifically the bile salt excort pump, which will transport bile acids out of the liver and into the bile, as well as an increase in the OST alpha beta transporter, which will move bile acids from the hepatocyte into the systemic circulation. Now, under normal physiology, there is a balance between the bile acid levels in the liver and the intestine so that it may aid in the absorption of food without causing any type of hepatotoxicity. However, as I mentioned previously, high levels of bile acids are associated with hepatotoxic events, and under certain pathophysiologic conditions, and I'm going to talk specifically about cholestasis, high levels of bile acid leads to liver damage. In this diagram here on the left, I'm showing what would be a normal bile acid load in the liver, where bile acids are taken up in the portal vein and excreted out into the bile. However, in diseases like cholestasis, there is damage to the bile duct network, leading to decreased transport of bile acids out of the liver, creating an unhealthy load of bile acids inside the hepatocyte causing liver damage. Highlighting this, again, back to the Fisher paper, they looked at the levels of endogenous bile acids in the liver in control subject relative to subjects with cholestasis. And you can see here, there is about a four-fold higher levels of endogenous bile acids with subjects with cholestasis relative to those with normal liver function. So what would be ideal in this particular case is to activate FXR with a cholestatic disease to decrease the bile acid synthesis and increase the export of the bile acids out of the hepatocyte. However, adding a bile acid in this condition would only exacerbate the condition. And therefore, what would be ideal is to have a potent FXR agonist which could activate it without exacerbating the bile acid load. And this is where, bio, where a beta cholic acid comes in, which is a selective and potent FXR agonist. A beta cholic acid is structurally very similar to kenodeoxycholic acid. Here on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the chemical structure of a beta cholic acid. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you kenodeoxycholic acid, which is the natural ligand for FXR. The difference between the two molecules is the addition of an ethyl group in the 6-alpha position. And this 6-ethyl group allows a beta-cholic acid a hundredfold more potency on FXR relative to kenodeoxycholic acid, making it an ideal candidate for diseases in cholestasis. Like bile acids, the beta-cholic acid is extensively conjugated in the liver to the amino acids glycine and taurine to form glyca-oca and tara-oca. Again, I re to reemphasize the importance of this conjugation, that it limits the distribution of OCA into tissues that express specific transporters involved in the uptake and excretion, and limits its distribution primarily to the liver and the gut. Next, I will go over the pharmacokinetics of a beta cholic acid in healthy subjects. We know that food significantly influences the release of conjugated bile acids from the gallbladder into the intestine, and therefore we knew that it would significantly influence the release of conjugated abeticolic acid. Therefore, in all of our clinical PK studies, we controlled meals during the study conduct. In this case, the subject who was fasted was given a 10 milligram oral dose of abeticolic acid and then refrained from eating until four and nine hours where they were given a standardized meal. When we look at the PK profile of a beta cholic acid, we can say that it is rapidly absorbed with maximum concentrations occurring anywhere from one and a half to two hours. However, you see that it is actually, the terminal phase is quite rapidly eliminated, and by six hours, there's very little of the parent left in the systemic circulation. And what this is reflecting is that a beta cholic acid is being taken up by the liver and is being conjugated to the glycine and the taurine. Now, in contrast, the profile of the conjugated glyca-oca is continuous over the 24-hour period, even after a single dose. Maximum concentrations of glyca-oca are observed anywhere from one to two hours after the administration of a meal, and this would take four or nine hours. The profile of taurine-oca is parallels that of glyca-oca, but typically in healthy subjects is lower. 
Again, maximum concentrations of taro oka were seen anywhere from one to two hours after the meal. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting here is that the levels of glyca oka and taro oka can vary depending on the dietary intake of a subject. So, for example, if a subject eats a lot of meat, they would typically have slightly higher taro oka levels and slightly lower levels of glyca oka. However, if a person is a vegetarian, not taking in any meat, the levels of glyca oka tend to be a little bit higher and the levels of taro oka tend to be a little bit lower. Now, the importance here is that the binding of FXR by a beta cholic acid and its two conjugates are approximately equally potent. And therefore, even though those two may vary, summing up a beta cholic acid and the two conjugates gives us a measurement of the total activity on FXR, which we refer to as total OCA. So in this presentation, especially when I talk about the hepatic impairment, I'm only going to show you the profile of total OCA a contribution of a beta cholic acid and its two conjugates. After daily administration of a beta cholic acid for 14 days, the profile of the parent OCA is not very different than it was on day one, and meaning that there wasn't very much accumulation. Maximum concentrations, again, occurred about an hour and a half after the meal, and you can see the rapid decline in the systemic exposure. One difference here, though, occurs is that the conjugates there is a significant accumulation of it. It's anywhere from six to seven fold, where I'm showing you for glyca oka. And now if I show you taro oka, it has a very similar profile and similar accumulation. Looking at this profile, if I were to sum up the parent and the two conjugates to give you total oka, you can see the vast majority of the contribution of total oka is from the two conjugates, which is consistent with what is known about bile acid physiology, which is OCA is going to be conjugated to taurine and glycine. I also want to point out two things. It's very clear here that foods will influence the pharmacokinetics of the drug, depending on the timing of the meal. And the other part is that six to seven fold accumulation is consistent with a predicted half-life of four days that was done with the modeling and the simulation. Next, I'm going to go over the pharmacokinetics of a beta cholic acid in subjects with hepatic impairment. Now, as I said earlier, we know from literature that the systemic exposure of bile acids is significantly altered. It's increased quite dramatically in patients with cirrhosis or hepatic impairment. But what is also known is that the liver and the intestinal concentrations only increase modestly. And so what's important to know with hepatic impairment are what are the changes that occur that cause these increases in the systemic exposure with only modest increases in the liver. Here I'm showing you again the diagram of the interhepatic recirculation of either bile acids, but this can be actually applied to a beta cholic acid as well. With hepatic impairment, the first thing that happens is there's a decrease in the functional liver volume due to the cirrhosis that occurs in the liver itself. In addition, there's a decrease in the uptake of bile acids, which causes an significant increase in the systemic concentrations of the bile acids. Due to the cirrhosis, there's a buildup of portal hypertension, and this buildup of pressure causes the portal vein to go under portal systemic shunting, where part of the flow is diverted away from the liver into the systemic circulation bypassing the liver. However, in response to this, the hepatic arterial response occurs where the arterial blood flow is increased to compensate for the decrease in the portal flow so that the total blood volume that is going to the liver remains relatively consistent in those patients with cirrhosis and not with cirrhosis. And then finally, there's an increase in the conjugation of tari. Now, to a certain extent, because tara oka and glyca oka have similar potency on FXR, the significance of this on the pharmacology is quite minimal. But I would like to point out that because the liver is no longer functioning at a high level with cirrhosis, there is typically more taurine available. And most likely, the increase in the taurine conjugation is because now that amino acid is more available relative to the glycine. We characterize the clinical pharmacokinetics of a beta cholic acid in a, with patients with hepatic impairment in a dedicated clinical pharmacology study. In this study, 
We also included subjects with normal hepatic function. And here's the profile of total loca, again, the sum of the parent and the two conjugates after a single 10 milligram dose. Comparing this to the PK profile of subjects with mild hepatic impairment, there was not much of a difference. However, when we looked at moderate hepatic impairment and severe hepatic impairment, we saw significant increases in the systemic exposure, and we would expect this based on what is already known about the physiology of bile acids. I would like to point out that we base the degree of hepatic impairment using the child Q scoring system. If we look at the overall exposure of total loca, AUC, and we compare it to subjects with normal liver function relative to those with mild, moderate, and severe hepatic impairment, we see there is very little difference in those subjects with mild hepatic impairment, but there was a four and 17-fold increase in the systemic exposure with moderate and severe hepatic impairment. In addition to looking at the levels of abeticolic acid, we also looked at the levels of endogenous bile acids in these same subjects. And if you look on the right-hand side, looking at the systemic levels of endogenous bile acids, we see a similar increase in the systemic concentrations of bile acids as we saw with abeticolic acid. And this gave us quite a bit of confidence that now that the bile acids look like they're behaving like abeticolic acid, or maybe more appropriately, abeticolic acid is acting like bile acids, we knew that we had confidence to leverage the knowledge that was out there regarding the hepatobiliary distribution of bile acids for abeticolic acid. Again, going back to the paper by Fisher et al., they looked at the systemic levels as well as the liver levels of endogenous bile acids in control subjects and in subjects with cirrhosis. If we compare the levels in the systemic exposure for those with normal liver function compared to cirrhosis, there was about a 20-fold increase in systemic concentrations. But importantly, the liver concentrations, which again is the primary site of action for abeticolic acid along with the intestine, there was less than a two-fold increase in the levels of the endogenous bile acids. And presumably, a beta-colic acid would follow this same trend. So this kind of led to a conundrum for me, at least in the very beginning. Typically, the way I've been trained, if the systemic concentrations went up tenfold, I would suggest that you decrease the dose by tenfold so that you can match the plasma concentrations. But if we followed that logic, most likely we would produce concentrations in the liver that were not high enough to at least give maximal response on FXR activation. So then came into the next part. How do we actually predict the concentrations of abeticolic acid in the liver and the intestine since we only measured the plasma concentration of the drug during the development program? I was very, very happy to learn that Dr. Gianni Molino, Dr. Alan Hoffman, and others had developed a physiologic pharmacokinetic model for kinodeoxycholic acid back in 1986. They based this physiologic PK model on all the work that they and others have done all the way back from the 1950s and on, and incorporating all these physiology into this model, they were able to predict not only the plasma concentrations of bile acids, they were able to predict the liver and the intestine. And so obviously this was a very important and significant starting point for us in the development of a physiologic PK model of abeticolic acid. The model consisted of three main systems, one for the circulatory, one for the hepatobiliary, and one for the intestine. The, systemic, the circulatory system consisted of three discrete compartments, one for the systemic, and there was one for the parent abeticolic acid, and then one for the conjugate glycooca, and one for tarooca. In addition, there was a compartment for the portal blood, and one for the sinusoidal blood. And I will point out that these are all physiologic volumes for the compartments, and the transfer rates between each of these compartments are actually blood flow rates that we could get from literature. For the, for the hepatobiliary system, there was a compartment for the liver for a beta-colic acid, which immediately conjugated to either glycine to form glycooca or to taurine to form tarooca. 
The two conjugates then could be secreted into the bile duct, which then can be sequestered into the gallbladder. And the model consisted of a component that allowed for the release of the conjugated abeticolic acid based on when the meal was given. There was a component for where bile could go directly into the intestine or from the gallbladder. Now, one way that the model for abeticolic acid differs from that uh, that was done for kenodeoxycholic acid is there were three discrete compartments for the intestine in the original model. We had found based on our modeling endeavors that it was better to simplify this into one compartment. And in this case, the conjugates are released into the intestine and two things can happen. They can either be reabsorbed into the portal blood and continue with the interhepatic recirculation that I talked about previously, or they can be deconjugated back to the parent. And this deconjugation occurs to a small extent in the small intestine, but to a much greater extent in the large intestine, where microbiota cleave off those amino acids, and in the end, you end up back with a beta-colic acid, which can either be reabsorbed itself or excreted in feces. So as you can see, this physiologic model really takes into account all the physiology that bile acids undergo. During the development of the physical module, there were two parts to it. In the first part, we characterized the pharmacokinetics of the beta acid in healthy subjects. We fitted the non-physiologic parameters of OCA, glyca OCA, and tara OCA in subjects receiving a 10 milligram dose from a very large bioequivalent study of 160 subjects. After we were able to produce a physiologic PK model for those subjects that are healthy, we incorporated all those physiologic changes that occur with cirrhosis into the model to account for the increases in the systemic concentrations of abeticolic acid, which again included portal systemic shunting, the reduction in hepatic uptake, reduction in liver volume, and an increase in taurine conjugation. In this figure here, I'm presenting the visual predictive check, which is an assessment of how well the model is predicting the observed data. So just quickly, the symbols, the blue symbols in this case, represent the individual plasma concentrations from the 160 subjects, taking a 10 milligram oral dose of OCA. The red line here represents the median observed data, and the two red dotted lines represent the 5th and 95th percentile of the observed data. The black line represents the predicted value from the model, which you can see does a very good job in predicting the data from the plasma. And the gray area represents the 90th prediction interval, which again takes into account the variability in the data in itself. I should mention that we included a, two parameters to estimate the between subject variability in the model. And those values, those parameters were put on the gallbladder and the absorption of abeticolic acid. We then characterized the residual variability using an additive proportional model. So as important as it is to be able to predict the systemic concentrations, to us it was almost more important to be able to predict the concentrations in the liver and the intestine. In this case, I'm showing you, showing you the simulated concentrations of total OCA in the plasma and the liver, where it's predicted to have a 20-fold higher concentrations in the liver relative to the plasma. And if you recall back to the Fisher paper where they looked at endogenous bile acid levels, this is in very good agreement, giving us even more confidence that we're able to translate what is known about bile acids into the pharmacokinetics of OCA. Next, we took into account all the physiologic changes that occur with cirrhosis, and I will go through them individually. In terms of the functional liver volume, the average liver, uh, liver volume is 0.95 liters in a healthy subject. For subjects with mild, milder, and severe hepatic impairment, you can see a decrease, where in the most severe state, there's an approximate 40% decrease in the liver volume. These values, fortunately, we were able to take from literature and did not have to be estimated using the data from the dedicated clinical pharmacology study in patients with hepatic impairment. Next, we looked at the decrease in the uptake or the hepatic extraction of the drug. 
In healthy subjects, the hepatic extraction ratio of OTA is 77%, which is quite high and is actually very consistent to what has been reported for both, uh, both for canodeoxycholic acid and cholic acid. And there's not much difference between the extraction ratio between healthy subjects and those with mild hepatic impairment. But as you can see, once you get to severe hepatic impairment, there's a significant decrease in the hepatic extraction ratio, and this really causes the majority of the increase in the systemic exposure of abeticolic acid, which is also applied to the increase that we saw in the bile acids themselves. Finally, we took into account the portal systemic shunting and the arterial buffer response that occurs from the due to the portal hypertension. In healthy subjects, there are no portal systemic shunting, but if we look under the most severe case, there is 45% shunting of the portal blood flow with a compensatory 92% increase in arterial blood flow. I would like to point out that we did not estimate these values, but again, they came from literature. Finally, we estimated the difference in the glycine to taurine conjugation rate. Under normal conditions, the ratio of glycine conjugate to taurine conjugate is about four and a half. However, in severe hepatic impairment, there's about equal conjugation between the glycine and the taurine. If we get an assessment of how the model did with predicting the profiles in subjects with normal liver function, shown in the upper left-hand side, relative to the subjects with mild hepatic impairment on the right-hand side, top, and those with moderate, bottom left, and severe hepatic impairment, bottom right, we see that there is relatively good agreement between the systemic exposure that was observed in our clinical pharmacology study relative to the physiologic PK model. But again, most importantly, what we wanted to understand was not only this change in systemic concentration, but what would be the predicted changes in the liver concentration. So taking this model, we went back and we simulated what the concentrations would be in the plasma and in the liver. Shown in this bar graph here are the concentrations of total ALKA and its bold increase in the plasma in the liver for subjects with mild hepatic impairment, moderate hepatic impairment, and severe hepatic impairment. Consistent with our, our clinical pharmacology study, we saw significant increases in the systemic concentrations of the drug with moderate and severe hepatic impairment, but very little with mild. But importantly, we saw very little difference in liver concentrations with mild hepatic impairment and only a 1.5 or a 1.7-fold increase in liver concentrations for those with moderate and severe hepatic impairment. And so this, again, goes back to that conundrum. We're seeing disproportionate increases in the systemic concentrations relative to the concentrations of the site of action, specifically we're talking about the liver. Now, before I can talk about the alternative dosing regimen in subjects with moderate and severe hepatic impairment, I actually need to tell you what is the normal dosing regimen in patients with primary biliary cholangitis. Now, I'm going to go through these next few set of slides relatively quickly. So I'll tell you, if you're going to remember anything, the normal dosing regimen of abeticolic acid is to give 5 milligrams once daily. That can be titrated to 10 milligrams once daily based on tolerability and response. Primary biliary cholangitis is a rare autoimmune cholestatic liver disease, and it is characterized by destruction of the bile ducts. So here we have a healthy liver, and here we have the destruction of the bile ducts due to the PBC in the disease. This leads to high levels of bile acids inside the liver, and thus an FXR agonist like a beta cholic acid would be ideal candidate to help try to alleviate some of the symptoms and disease pathology. During the development program of abeticolic acid with PBC, we studied multiple doses in healthy subjects in phase one. In the phase two and phase three program, we looked at doses anywhere from five milligrams up to 50 milligrams. But in the pivotal phase three study, we looked at two doses, one where you started at five milligrams and were able to titrate to 10 milligrams once daily, and another where you were able to just dose at 10 milligrams once daily immediately. In this program, the primary endpoint was actually two markers of the liver, alkaline phosphatase, as well as total bilirubin. In this slide here, I'm showing you an exposure response relationship 
for alkaline phosphatase from the pivotal phase three study. On the y-axis is the change in the alkaline phosphatase that is observed with the five and 10 milligram dose given once daily relative to the plasma concentrations that are seen. And you can see there's a clear relationship between plasma exposure and the reductions in alkaline phosphatase. With a five milligram dose producing a substantial decrease in alkaline phosphatase and a 10 milligram dose to produce essentially maximal responses in reducing alkaline phosphatase. We also developed an exposure response relationship for bilirubin where we saw similar trends that a five milligram dose would produce substantial changes and a 10 milligram dose would produce maximal response. Now, the endpoint was actually not the individual components, but actually a composite of the two endpoints for the phase three study, where if a subject achieved alkaline phosphatase levels less than 1.6 times the upper limit of normal, or also had to include a 15% reduction in the overall alkaline phosphatase levels, and that their bilirubin levels were below the upper limit of normal, it was considered successful. Using this exposure response model and the PK data from the pivotal phase three study, we predicted what the probability of achieving that composite endpoint would be. In this figure here, I'm presenting the predicted composite endpoint from the modeling relative to the observed response for the PK subgroup of the pivotal phase three study. As you can see, there's good agreement between the observed and the predicted values. What is significant here is that the titration group that went from five milligrams to 10 milligrams responded similarly to the subjects that received a 10 milligram dose from the beginning. But what we observed was that there was greater tolerability with the titration. And that's why the dosing recommendation of subjects with PBC that are, do not have hepatic impairment is to start off at five milligrams once daily and then can titrate to 10 milligrams based on the tolerability and the response. Now I'm gonna go through the dosing recommendation of a beta -colic acid in patients with hepatic impairment. So going back to what I said previously, we know from our clinical pharmacology study that mild hepatic impairment really didn't have any differences in the systemic exposure relative to those of normal liver function, and therefore no dose adjustment is needed with subjects with mild hepatic impairment based on child Pew scoring system. However, this is where we ran into the problem. With moderate and severe hepatic impairment, we just thought that it would be better to give a dose where we believe the liver concentrations would be high enough to activate FXR to make sure that we maximize the efficacy. <clears throat> However, based on regulatory feedback, they felt that it would be more important to establish the tolerability at lower doses where the plasma concentrations would be similar between the hepatically impaired and non-hepatically impaired, and then titrate upwards to achieve concentrations in the liver that we believe that would be fully efficacious. And thus, the dosing recommendation of abeticolic acid in subjects with moderate and severe hepatic impairment is to give a five milligram once weekly dose for three months. Looking at the bottom figure here, we see that the plasma concentration of a beta-colic acid with a five milligram once weekly dose in subjects with severe hepatic impairment is similar to those with subjects without hepatic impairment receiving the five milligram once daily dose. However, if we look over to the right-hand side, we see that the predicted liver concentrations will be well below that that are predicted for the five and 10 milligram once daily dose in subjects without hepatic impairment. So based on this, the regulatory agency, we agreed that the subjects could move to a five milligrams twice weekly dose after three months, as long as they could tolerate it and if they needed more of a response. If we again look down in the bottom part of the figure, we see that a five milligram twice weekly dose will produce higher systemic concentrations, but importantly, we're achieving liver concentrations that are coming a little bit closer to the five milligram once daily dose. And then finally, if a subject is able to tolerate it and a greater response is needed, a 10 milligram twice weekly dose can be given. Where again, we'll see higher systemic concentrations, but importantly, we will see liver concentrations that are somewhat similar between the five and the 10 milligram dose in subjects with hepatic impairment. So in conclusion, we can see 
that the pharmacokinetics of abeta cholic acid is very similar to that of endogenous bile acids, and that we were able to use a physiologic PK model originally based on bile acids to describe the kinetics and, importantly, the hepatobiliary disposition of abeta cholic acid. And this model was used to support the dosing rationale of abeta cholic acid in patients with moderate and severe hepatic impairment. Now, like almost every talk, I gave you the pretty picture where everything worked out perfectly in every one of the scenarios, but I'll tell you, as my professor would say, everything is in the detail. And so I have to thank, first, two groups. Here at Interstem Pharmaceuticals, I want to thank Carl Lassert. Carl Lassert heads up the pharmacometrics group at Intercept, and he is very diligent both in the modeling and understanding the background and literature and science as it applies to the modeling, especially when it comes to bile acids. And I know for a fact that this model would never have been developed without him. On the other end, I need to thank Sitara, who, when I first started the program here, I was the clinical pharmacology group, and I came to them showing them this 27 compartment model that I thought would be a really great idea to characterize the PK of OCA. I'm very happy to say that they agreed to take on the project, and I really must uh, thank Thomas Pere and Natalie for their contributions, because this certainly was not an easy endeavor for both of us. There was multiple correspondence between Intercept and Sitara, and I felt like this was a really great collaboration between the two of them. Finally, I must thank tremendously Dr. Alan Hoffman. If you don't know who Dr. Alan Hoffman is, he is the leading expert in bile acids. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to him for many reasons. One, I'm thankful for him and Gianni Molino to realize that I would need a PK model back in 2017 to explain a beta cholic acid. But importantly, I need to thank Dr. Alan Hoffman because he was very patient and worked with me in explaining everything about physiology of bile acids which I must tell you, I think I lost the majority of my knowledge that I learned back in undergraduate and graduate school by the time that I came to Intercept. He is a very generous man, and I just cannot thank him enough on this one. And I must also point out that Alan and Gianni Molino came up with this model in 1986. And I will say in 1986, I was in high school working on the very first Macintosh, and I cannot figure out how on earth he actually was able to produce this model that was accurate to predict the profile of bile acids. So with that, I would be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, we now invite our audience to enter your questions into the Q&A box for Dr. Edwards. Looks like uh, we have a question from our audience. Um, someone would like to know, Bile acid and OCA conjugates are limited to organs that express specific transporters involved in the uptake and excretion of bile acid, which included the kidney. What is the significance of renal excretion on elimination of OCA? Yes, this is an interesting question. The original model that was presented by Alan Hoffman actually brought in the influence of renal excretion, but is they kind of pointed out it wasn't considered to be very important and therefore wasn't included in the final model. What I will tell you is during the development program of abetic cholic acid, we have looked at the excretion of radiolabeled OCA. And in that study, we found that less than 3% uh, of the drug is excreted in the urine and the vast majority is being excreted in the feces. And therefore, the influence of that one isn't very high. Now, I will say under certain pathophysiologic changes, the, the significance of it may become a little bit higher, and that's something that we continue to evaluate even to this day. Someone would like to know um, whether you considered measuring OCA concentrations in liver biopsies to further validate your models. I will tell you that I would love to measure the liver concentrations of abetic cholic acid. Unfortunately, during the program with PBC, we used the markers of alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin, which are uh, levels that you measure systemically, and we didn't have biopsy values to go, or biopsies to go back to to measure the concentrations of it. But certainly, it's a very good point. 
someone would like to know, what's your thoughts on using a physiologically based pharmacokinetic approach to replace dedicated organ impairment PK studies to guide dosing in these patients? Or can we do a reduced design and use the model to estimate the concentration, the drug concentrations in patients with severe impairment? This is a very interesting question to me because I, we are further developing the model for different types of changes that occur with liver diseases, and this would apply very directly with it. My suggestion would be you would definitely, at a minimal, would like to start with a model to at least predict the changes that you observe. And perhaps in a certain way, you know, having discussions with the regulatory agencies or whatever ethics or IRB that you're working with that maybe to evaluate early on whether the model is able to predict the changes and therefore somehow do a reduced design like you're talking about. So as we, as we build their wealth of knowledge with a model, I'm hoping that this model is not the end, but others have the opportunity to take it and develop it for their needs, that we may learn more and more of what's going on with the petability distribution of all drugs. Someone says that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that exogenous bile acids in the liver at high enough concentrations can be hepatotoxic. OCA is similar to endogenous bile acids. Why does dosing of OCA itself not cause hepatotoxicity? Yeah. The, the key to this one is that abetacolic acid is a hundredfold more potent relative to kinodeoxycholic acid. So when we administer OCA, we're administering very low doses of five and 10 milligrams once daily, at least in non-hepatically impaired. When we measure the concentration of the endogenous bile acids relative to abeticolic acid, we can see that the levels are less than 5%, often even less than 3% in the patient population. Therefore, we're not adding at all to the burden load of the bile acids in there. Someone wants to know, um, what is the total OCA pharmacokinetic profile beyond 14 days? Uh, so, for example, at 28 days, do you consider to see accumulation or have you achieved steady state by 14 days? So, we actually, when I've shown the profiles here for simplicity, I only showed you the 24 hours. But in that study that we used to characterize the PK in healthy subjects, we actually went out to one week. And so, you can see that the drug has a very total OCA, the conjugates and the parents, has a very long elimination profile. And based on the modeling, we were able to estimate it to be four days. Based on that, and even based on data that we've done in the phase one studies, we can say, see that it takes approximately 14 days to achieve steady state, and that there's about a six to seven fold accumulation, especially of the conjugates consistent with the four day half life. In the, the SAD and MAD studies, different, different higher doses were tested as compared to the five and 10 milligram doses that were tested in phase two and three. How did you select these final doses if you didn't test them in the initial SAD and MAD studies? So actually, one thing that I realized I left out in that talk is the original SAD-MAD study started at doses from 20 up to uh, 500 milligrams doses. But actually, we went back uh, during the phase two program when we realized we would need lower doses, and we did study doses of 5, 10, and 25. And we see that it is, um, for the most part, linear, especially when we're talking about the parents. Someone wants to know, is there strong potential to help alleviate border, borderline obstructive cholestasis when combined with ursodeoxycholic acid? I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, not answer this one. I don't know the answer, and I'd much rather have one of our clinical colleagues uh, answer that one in particular. So my apologies. Was the plasma bile acid profile before and after OCA administration measured in these studies? Yes, they were actually measured in the studies uh, for the patients with PBC, and we did see a decrease in the systemic concentrations of the bile acids. But I want to I note that that actually helps to confirm that obviously we're having the pharmacology that we expect with the reduction of the bile acids. But again, the importance would probably be a decrease in the bile acid levels in the liver, and that's where some of this modeling even comes important when we're talking about the endogenous bile acids. Okay, hey, that looks to be all the, all the questions from our audience. We've had a, a really 
great and robust uh, discussion. We appreciate all the, all the questions from our audience. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, before